this today in your lives as educators, parents, and leaders. We hope that these conversations will provide hope for transforming the field of education and add fuel to the push for equity, access, and inclusion. My name is Peter Blair. I'm on the faculty at Harvard University, where I'm an assistant professor of education at HTSC and a co-director of the Harvard Project on Workforce, which is an interdisciplinary cross-school initiative spanning HGSC, HBS, and the Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy at HKS. I'm really looking forward to today's conversation, where we will talk about the changing skills for the 21st century workplace, the impact of the global pandemic, and the role of education in preparing young people to succeed. But first, I want to let you know that today's episode is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the Harvard Education YouTube channel and Facebook page. You can also visit hgse.me slash ednow. Again, that's hgse.me slash ednow for recordings and future information about episodes. You can also submit questions using the Q&A button, as well as find that closed captioning is available there too. I am absolutely thrilled and delighted to welcome two of my colleagues and friends as our special guest today. First off, we have Rafaela Sadun, who is a professor of business administration at Harvard Business School in the strategy unit. Rafaela is also one of the founders of the World Management Survey and Executive Time You Study. Welcome, Rafaela. Thank you for having me. Our second guest is David Deming, who is a professor of education and economics at HGSC, as well as a professor of public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, where he's the director of the Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy and the Harvard Project on Workforce. Welcome, David. Uh, thanks for having me, Peter and Rafael. It's great, great to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, and I want to say welcome to all of our guests who are joining us from oh, the four corners of the earth, whether you're in a time zone where it's morning or afternoon, good afternoon, good morning, good day. We're so thrilled to have you here. Just as a way of architecting our conversation today, we're going to try to have this conversation in three parts. So the first part, I want to introduce you to the absolutely fascinating work that both Rafaela and David have done at the intersection of education, skills, training, and the workplace. And in our second act, we want to take a deeper dive into COVID-19 and to try to unpack what are some of the ways in which the global pandemic has spotlighted existing inequalities within both the educational market and the labor market, and what are some things that we can do based on the insights that derive from the work that Rafaela and David have done and in our third act, we want to think about what are some ways forward in terms of creating a more equitable recovery, a more equitable uh, access to education and skill development within the U.S., but not just the U.S., but around the world. I also want to mention that we will be taking questions as well during this third segment, so please feel free to populate uh, the, the chat with your questions. All right, so let's get started. David, let me come to you. Tell us a bit about some of the work that you've done that looks at education and skills development. Uh, broad question. Good intro, Peter. Thanks. Uh, so I, I'm an economist like, like you, Peter, and, and like Rafaela. And so um, we tend to take, I would say, a somewhat um, um, skills-based perspective on issues in the labor market. So in particular, um, not necessarily thinking about skill gaps, but thinking about how do we create smoother pathways um, so between education and training institutions that includes colleges but also other places that give people skills and help people develop their skills into the labor market right and so if you look at the us compared to many other countries we, we really don't do very much to help people transition from education into jobs uh, we spend about 20 percent of what other oecd nations do on so-called active labor market programs, which includes you know, wage subsidies, includes training, apprenticeships, things like that. There are lots of models out there around the world. The US model is much more decentralized than others and is kind of a market-based laissez-faire system, which has its strengths to be sure, but in a time like this, when everything is disrupted and when many people have lost jobs and need to get back into the workforce, it, it doesn't serve us well always. And so um, a lot of the work that I'm doing and some of it is with you, Peter, um, is trying to understand how we can you know, make those pathways smoother. And that, that ranges from basic research into the nature of skills. So what is it that we're actually trying to teach people and, and how do we give them capacities that enable them to move throughout an entire career and not just get the first job, but build soft skills like teamwork, critical thinking, 
problem solving that help you in a wide range of job skills that are you know, broadly transferable. And then really thinking about kind of, I guess the policy and practice implications of some of these things. So what, if we wanted to build these skills for people, if we wanted to create smoother pathways, how would it look? You know, we have use cases in many different parts of the US and in other countries, you know, this particular program worked for these people at this point in time. But at least to my read, very little in the way of generalized knowledge about why some things work and why others don't. And if we could reimagine the education and workforce system to accomplish some of the goals we want to accomplish, how would we reimagine it? And so broadly speaking, that's the kind of work that I'm really interested in doing. That's where I, that's what I'm doing a lot of thinking about right now um, and excited to dig into it more. Yeah. And if I can dig a little bit deeper, Dave, something that you're incredibly well known for in the profession is really thinking about the, the, the types of skills that often are neglected. So we think about the notion of soft skills and the extent to which soft skills have proliferated within the U.S. labor market. And in fact, these soft skills are very complementary to what we think of as the, the hard skills or the cognitive skills. Can you talk a bit more about skill measurement insofar as your work has been very pioneering and looking at soft skills and now increasingly you're thinking about decision making as a type of, of human capital as well too. So, so talk to us a bit about skill measurement and why that is really important. Sure. I mean, I think the term really says it all, doesn't it? Soft skills. Why do we call it that? There's nothing intellectually coherent about the things that we lump under the umbrella of soft skills. You know, what does decision making and problem solving have to do with teamwork or we are a strong work ethic? Really nothing except that there are things we don't fully understand, either scientifically or practically, in the sense of, you know, who has these skills? We have these very, I would say, poor ways of figuring out who has these kinds of skills. You know, we have a resume, we have you know, transcripts, <clears throat> we do job interviews. Those are all kind of screening technologies that are designed to figure out what skills people have, and they, they don't work very well. And so a lot of the work I've been trying to do is trying to make, if you like, soft skills harder, you know, more scientific, better measured. So just to give you one example, um, some work I uh, did with a um, student of mine at the ed school, Ben Weidman, uh, where we tried to develop a method to identify what makes somebody a good team player. So what, and to be more precise about that is, can you isolate people's ability to contribute to teams mm -hmm. independent of their own skill at whatever they're doing? So if you, you had a chess playing team and you added a chess grandmaster to the team, that person would make the team better at chess but not because they're a good team player or a good communicator or a facilitator because they're good at chess, right? And their team is playing chess. So you need to have some strategy for isolating this kind of teamwork skills from just general skills at whatever you're doing. And so we designed this two-stage experiment where in the first step, we measured people's ability to do things as individuals. And then we randomly assigned them to groups. And we had the groups do very similar analogs of what the individuals are doing so that we had a good prediction of how well each group would do based on the skills of the individuals on the team. Mm -hmm. And then of course, some groups outperform their prediction and some underperform their prediction. Um, and the question is, is that a reliable, if you just do it, measure that once, you don't know if the group did better than expected, is it because of Peter? Is it because of Rafaela? Is it because of David? Or is it because of some chemistry between the three of them? You know, we, all, we have great chemistry, so uh, we would be a great team. And we don't know why if we just did it once. And so what we do instead is we, we then will take Peter and we'll assign him to a team with Jody and Barry. And then Peter will be on a team with Karen and Doug and so on and so forth. And if every time Peter is assigned to a new team, that team outperforms its prediction, then Peter is a team player. Um, and there's some kind of you know, math behind why that works, but it works. Um, and we, we find that some people really are good team players. When you put them on a team, net of their individual skill at the tasks we're giving them, they make the team perform better, the team exerts more effort, the team is happier, um, and the team you know, just produces more output on whatever measure. And the one thing that we found that's related to being a team player is your score on a widely used test of emotional and social intelligence called the reading the mind and the eyes test. Mm -hmm. um, I don't say that to mean that everyone should start using this test, but it's more of an indicate, it's kind of a proof of concept to say that there is this skill that we can measure reliably using this technique. And it's related to something that psychologists think captures emotional intelligence, which is can mm -hmm. you read emotions in people's faces. And it's not related to traditional measures of skill, like you know, with how, how well you perform on an IQ test or your grades or your educational attainment or other things like that. And so that's a, just one example of kind of the work we're doing at the Project on Workforce, trying to make soft skills harder. And, and the, you know, if you think like, why does that experiment matter? It matters because if this is a skill that employers want and we're not doing a good job of measuring it, then we're certainly not doing as good of a job as we could of developing it. And so let's, let's start along that path of, of developing and measuring that skill and elevating people who have it. 
Yeah, that, that's a great introduction, Dave, to the work that you're doing. And we're going to come back to a lot of those themes too. And as I move to Raffaella, we're going to see too that there are a lot of connections and synergies in terms of the work that, that you're doing and that Raffaella and her colleagues at the business school are doing too. Raffaella, give us a sense of some of the things that you have been working on. I know that you focus a lot more thinking about organizations and leaders, and that's complementary to, to, to Dave looking at the, the individual workers. So give us a broad view of, of your work. Absolutely. And, you know, it was so interesting to hear David speak because I think in a sense, we come from a very, very similar angle and at the same time, completely different unit of of observation. I started, you know, I'm an economist too. And I started with the notion that there are so many differences across firms in, you know, starting from the performance and productivity. We know that firms are very heterogeneous, but for for the longest time, we couldn't really understand why, you know, what was the magic sauce that made organizations perform so differently. And so similar to David, this started, you know, I'm embarrassed to say, almost 18 years ago in my career. But, you know, I was very lucky to join a team uh, of, uh, of uh, economists who had started just when I was doing my PhD to measure and make, you know, it's not soft skill in this case, it's management practices. It's the M word, which had been forbidden in economic circle for the longest time. It was, you know, right, your IQ was immediately going down by 20 points if you, manage, if you mentioned the word management in economic circles. But you know what we what we did over the past uh, uh, you know many many years is to say look if you uh, find a way to measure these differences in management practices as, or, or across organizations look what you find is tremendous differences in the way in which companies are organized and managed and differences that matter for performance so you might ask why are why why am I here because. Over the past of the uh, of the last you know past few years, I I realized that I was looking at this notion of management practices too much as an engineer, not as a human being. And if you really go inside organizations, you realize that what makes some organizations click is not some abstract technology. It's not just reading a manual and applying a manual. It comes down to the people that are inside organizations and. Um, very interestingly, I think related to David, I think there is something about that chemistry, that ability to bring people together, which is extremely important, especially when you're in situations where experts need to, you know, you have teamwork and you have different complementary expertise that needs to come together. Uh, th- those type, those are the managerial skills that I think really make a difference. And eventually what we measured in our world management survey, these different qualities, my sense is that they're very, very related to the ability to bring in the organization and foster uh, the growth of these great uh, team leaders at the end. Um, and so, you know, it's been a little bit of a, of a shock because, I, as you said, I teach strategy and for the longest time strategy uh, at the business school was taught as an abstract uh, um, theoretical exercise where the CEO looks outside the window and devises a wonderful plan and then everybody will obey to and will implement. And it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you know, as we know, uh, the, w- the reason why certain organizations are aligned and work well, it's because that leader perhaps has understood how to motivate, how to bring people together. And, you know, that's eventually uh, leadership that perhaps matters even more than than your, you know, strategic uh, forecast abilities. So that's where our, our paths connected. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, and just staying with Rafaela for a bit more, I know that recently you've been thinking a lot about the kinds of skills that make good leaders. On this, on this cast, we have a number of folks who might be principals, who might be school leaders, who might be CEOs of companies. Can you tell us a bit about what are some of the changing demands of skills for workers who are in positions of leadership? Yeah, sure. I have to say it's, uh, I was really, you know, when I read David's paper on the social skills of middle managers, that that paper totally resonated with me. And it so happened that I was able to uh, obtain data that is usually not available. These are job descriptions for C-suite positions over the course of 20 years. So, you know, I'm not going to go into the technical details. It was a lot of fun. We decoded all this text and created categories of skills that we could actually measure goes back to the measure, measurement point that is so important and sort of trace over time and across a large number of firms. We're talking about uh, almost 5,000 firms, very large organizations. And to maybe a little bit, you know, to our surprise, what we found was this tremendous increase in the demand for social skills. 
which are exactly the social skills of you know, being able to persuade others, motivate them, and bring them with you. And at the same time, a steep decline in what we call operational skills, which are basically things that you know, at the C-suite level may be delegated to others. It's the actual doing stuff. Now, I think that this is you know, something interesting. I'm not saying that uh, CEOs should never have uh, these operational skills, but for the type of complex organizations that I examine in that paper, um, it's, it's, I think re- what this data is telling us is that it's more important to foster the cooperation uh, inside organizations rather than doing directly. And that's because you can find some other expertise that would do directly, but that added value of the person at the top is really uh, that coordination piece. And Peter, if I may add, I think that this is something that is valid, not just in the private sector, but if you think about organizations like hospitals or schools for that matter, where you, you have a lot of experts, sometimes come with a bit of ego too, but you know, you really, that top down model of command and control is not gonna be very effective there. My sense is that those skills will be also very, very important in those settings. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's, it's wonderful to be on this panel with you because I think each of us focuses on a piece of this puzzle that is complementary. So we have a Raffaella thinking a lot about leaders and thinking about organizations, Dave thinking a lot about middle managers. And in some of my own work with Opportunity at Work, I think a lot about who are workers that are not included, particularly workers who don't have college degrees, and how do we recognize the skills of those workers when they may not have the traditional uh, signals that we would, we would typically have. And, and, and thinking about how could you look at the, the skills that they're learning on the job and finding creative ways to measure that so that these workers themselves are skilled through alternative routes, or we, we like to call them stars. And so I think about us as, as each fitting into different pieces of the puzzle that are really important for how we think about the way in which education uh, functions and also the way in which firms can recognize the skills of workers. I know for many people that are joining the, 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 the cast today, top of mind for them is the global pandemic. We've all lived through these past 12 years as individuals, um, some of us on this call as parents as well, who have kids that are in school, and, and also as educators where we've had to teach students and we've had to operate in a university context with this huge disruption. I want to now turn to what what have been some of the things that have been most surprising to you about the COVID pandemic in terms of in terms of the disruptions that we've seen. Uh, David, let me come back to you. Sure. Okay. So m- most surprising things. Well, I would say, um, gosh, Peter, it's a tough question. I have to because in some sense, what I'm doing is I'm going back um, to a year ago and and trying to get back into the mind space of when when this all happened. I still remember. The last day I left my office, which is like one of those windows up there on my screen. Um, I think I, you know, we didn't know for the longest time how things were going to go. You know, and the Harvard campus closed, I believe, March 10th or 11th. Everybody just went home. We didn't even know if people were coming back for graduation. And I don't think anybody knew at the time that this was, we were still going to be in this situation a year from now. So I would say that one of the things that surprised me is, I would say, maybe I'll say on the positive side, on the negative side, what surprised me is the resilience of educators and of educational institutions. Um, I think online teaching and learning is not as good as the real thing in large part, but I think that um, people have shown tremendous creativity um, and the technological tools such as Zoom that we're using now and other tools, other pedagogical tools, have really been there for the challenge. And I think one of the lasting positive impacts of this is that everybody, I mean, everybody has familiarity with these tools in a way that will enable new kind of hybrid forms of learning. Not that we'll go, you know, kids will be home. You know, I think kids will be in school, but when it comes to supplementing, certainly instruction at the classroom level, the college level, um, I think, you know, faculty, I know I'll be more creative about asking students to do things that are asynchronous because I've had some experience with it. And I know that all, all of them have experience with it too. So you're not asking people to learn a whole new technology and set of softwares. So I think that's not something I really foresaw, but I think it's gonna be really important in, in ways that I think we could predict a little bit down the road, but I think even longer down the road, you know, we're gonna find ways to experiment with these technologies in ways that really boost learning and allow it to complement the in-person experience. I think on the, on the, Negative side, you know, I've also been surprised, not maybe surprised is the wrong word, but surprised slash discouraged at how hard it is to maintain 
that that sense of motivation and, and frankly just belonging that comes you know learning is hard it's mm -hmm. mentally challenging and taxing to learn new things and i didn't really think about it this way when i took for granted the in-person learning experience but i think a lot of what we're doing in the classroom is we're giving our students a sense of belonging and motivation and kind of camaraderie that allows us to overcome the hard slog of learning and if mm -hmm. all you have is the hard slog and you don't have the feeling of togetherness it's so much harder and so when I step onto a Zoom, not this one, but of course, because we're having a great time with other Zooms, I feel the sense of exhaustion yeah. among the faces in the Zoom room. And I know that maybe that's just me, I'm projecting, but yeah. I, I think that's real. And I think it's going to take longer than we think to recover from that. I think everybody, you know, just, I, I have so much more appreciation for the in-person experience. Um, and, I, and I'm talking as someone who, who's relatively fortunate, you know, whose kids yeah. are getting some education this year, who, who has, has been able to continue doing my job, you know, as a faculty member. Um, so anyway, it's, it's, it's going to take a long time for us to fully understand what mm -hmm. COVID has done to all of us and to recover from it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that perspective, Dave. I, I like that you took the time to go back in time because that almost forced me to go back in time in the same way too. And I, it was a little painful, but I did it for you, Peter. I know. And I, 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 I empathize. And, and, and I remember too, because I was teaching a class on how the future of work is going to affect the future of education. And that class all of a sudden felt incredibly relevant in the exact moment. And, you know, prior to that, I had moved to Harvard maybe three years ago. And so I still had students who were at Clemson. And so I was remote with those students to help them to navigate through their PhD. And so that experience for me, thankfully, helped me to, to, to transition a bit more successfully. But I think, I think you're right. There, there, there's a lot of ways in which we have lost. And there are also a lot of ways in which we have learned too. I've, I've really enjoyed thinking about how you can use the technologies of breakout rooms or the chat to engage students in a very multimodal way. And when we think about the way in which people learn nowadays. I, I, you can see someone sitting in a coffee shop, listening to music, chatting with someone, watching a movie while they're doing homework too. And in some ways, this kind of like super inputted technology way of learning, there, there, there's a lot of similarities to, to kind of like how people go about their daily lives. Raphael, I want to bring you into this and, and connect it with some of your research. So you have a series of recent papers that uses a lot of really interesting data that looks at time use and that also looks at email communications. And you and your team have been able to document um, the impact of, of, of time use during the pandemic. What have been some of the surprising findings that have come out of this that you've learned about you know, the work from home revolution and also even the way in which people collaborate? Sure. Uh, yeah, so look, I mean, in a way, um, it's, uh, I don't think I was surprised, but, you know, we were able to examine millions of emails that were sent across different parts of the world that were, experiences, were experiencing lockdown. And so with lockdown comes the inability to go and work in the office. So these are places where you lose that center of gravity, which is working together in the same physical space. And what we see is probably what we've all experienced, uh, uh, which is, you know, massive increase in our work span, uh, on average, like an hour added to our uh, day of work, which, you know, we start earlier, we, we end much later. Um, and then, you know, I think I'm going to tell you what we found and then how I interpret it. We found that the um, number of messages and emails that people send in a number of meetings have, especially in the very uh, early stages of these lockdowns, increased tremendously. Massive increase in these very short meetings, but uh, a lot of them during the day. And the way in which we interpreted this is that we need uh, that type of, uh, of interaction. We need to be connected with people. And in the very early stages of the pandemic, our way of coping with that was probably having these brief check-ins and trying to be together virtually. Over time, something that I find really interesting is how well we've adapted to these new modes of communication. Uh, we found others. I'm on Slack. I wasn't on Slack a year ago, for example. But I would agree with David that this is costly. It's a really costly adjustment. I think we coped very well in the first phases of the emergency that we had nothing else available. Uh, but now there is this you know, hunger for social connection. I go to HBS, that's my own experience. I see a colleague, maybe I would have not even said hi to that colleague a year ago. I wanna hug this, per this person. Obviously if I try to hug them, they run away because of COVID. But you know what I mean? It's like, we, I, I, I think that we will, uh, cherish those moments of physical interactions much more than we did before. 
from an educational standpoint, it's amazing that our audience has expanded so much. I teach at a business school in executive education courses. I give you one concrete example. I have many more women now in my class. Mm-hmm. because, you know, for a woman, it's very hard to, to travel and leave their kids. So it's clear that for certain parts of the population, uh, that transition might have opened doors that did not exist before. I am very worried about that other part of the population that is completely excluded from these changes. And I mean, if there was something on a policy level that I think is, is really urgent and immediate is try to bridge this digital gap or provide you know, different um, alternatives for, we know that there is a part of society that is not on this platform. And I think we should really try our best to bring them on or do something for to, to bridge this, I think, diverging um, uh, divergence of experiences. Yeah, you, you, you touched, Raphael, on, on several key themes that really resonate with, with my own personal experience as an educator. I, do, I have felt that the days have gotten longer. I have felt that I've had more meetings, that they've been shorter, but there have been more of them. And on the plus side, too, in terms of the broadening of the audience, I think you're absolutely right. Something that we've been able to do at the, at the ad school here at Harvard is to have an online uh, part a, a part-time online program, and that has drawn in a, a cadre of students who are incredibly experienced, who many of them are established in their careers, and they otherwise it would have been very difficult for them to take time away from their careers and their families to to join to join our community at, at HGSC. But they've joined and they've added such a depth of richness, and there's been so much gratitude for having the opportunity to do that. And I, I sincerely hope that we do take away some of the positives from this experience and that we also recognize some of the ways in which the pandemic has spotlighted existing inequalities in higher education. And we can have an increased sense of urgency as we return back to a newish normal. Uh, think Picking up on this theme of, of, of the, the inequality that's been exposed through the pandemic, Dave, I know that we have a, a colleague, Josh Goodman and, and his co-authors at, at BU who've documented that there's been a huge increase in educational inequality during this time, where for the most part, uh, high income families, highly educated families, like the parents have been able to supplement the education of their kids by online resources. And and some of that is driven by the digital divide. The other trend that we've seen at an institutional level is the divergence in the resources at um, elite universities versus community colleges. And I know that this is something that you care a lot about and you've written about extensively the role of community colleges during um, these times. Can you tell us a bit more about um, why you think that community colleges are incredibly important during this moment? And what are some of the things that we could be doing to support community college leaders, uh, educational leaders, as well as students? Sure, so I actually wanna answer, there were two, I wanna answer the first question about learning loss quickly and then talk about community colleges. Because I have something specific that I wanna recommend to folks. So a colleague of ours, Matt Kraft, who's at Brown, wrote recently a kind of white paper about the idea of expanding high dosage tutoring in K through 12 schools to, to address learning loss. And I think that is an, a truly excellent idea. I think particularly in subjects like math that are modular and that where one lesson builds on another, learning loss can have devastating consequences because if you don't learn how to you know, multiply and divide fractions, it prevents you from learning all the things that come after that. For example, you can think of a thousand other examples with something like math. With reading, it's also true, you know, basic, basic, if you don't understand sentence structure, you can't write very well, et cetera. But with math, especially, these things are relatively easy to diagnose, especially using personalized learning software. So you could bring a bunch of students in, figure out and diagnose specific learning gaps, and then remediate them using a mastery-based approach in a relatively short amount of time. And you don't need all of the traditional infrastructure of schools to do it. So his idea was basically to have a tutor core and to possibly mm-hmm. use stimulus or other funding to fund a temporary effort to identify and address learning gaps among students to get them back on track so that they're not harmed permanently by the pandemic. And if I could wave a magic wand and pass one nationwide policy about K-12 schooling, that would be it. And so if any of you listening have any ability to try to make that happen in your communities, please do so and I would be happy to help because I just think it's critically important. It makes me sad and desperate feeling the idea that students, because of a specific learning gap that they face due to COVID, will have will face lifelong consequences from it. And so I think we need to we need to fix that. So I wanted to say that. And before um, you move on, Dave, I just want to yeah. underline that point. So hold on to your second point. So what David is saying is we need the equivalent of like AmeriCorps, but a tutor core. 
where we can provide access to high quality individualized tutoring for students who have experienced learning loss, right? And so again, for those of you out there who might have the resources or the political pull or otherwise begin to think about ways to, to create some kind of a structure where that could be implemented either locally or at the state level or at the federal level. I just want to underscore that, David, your second. Um, yeah, and, and let me just, I, I can't resist. So, so many of our problems in education are hard because we don't have a full diagnosis and we don't have a roadmap to success. You know, so how do we remediate the effects of long-term stress and poverty on children's emotional and mental health? Like that's a hard problem because it's not like we have a silver bullet fix. This is a case where we actually know what the fix is. We can diagnose people's learning loss and we can remedy it. It's just a question of, of doing it and of the political will and the money. And so that to me, that's, those are problems we just have to solve because we actually know the roadmap. Anyway, so, so um, on community colleges, I think it's a similar issue. I mean, if you look, what I'm very animated by in thinking about community colleges is the lessons we learned from the Great Recession. So the last crisis we faced in this country, now more than 10 years ago, um, big financial crisis. What happened? We passed a stimulus package that greatly increased Pell Grant funding, which was a good thing. Um, but there was no money that was spent directly in public institutions. And at the same time that we had a big boost in federal funding, community colleges, which are funded by state and local appropriations, legislative appropriations, had their funding cut rather dramatically in some cases because state budgets, unlike the federal government, cannot run a deficit. And so they rely on tax receipts and many of them have balanced budget amendments or what's called tax and expenditure limitations, which basically tells them they can't spend more than they're raising. And so when they have a revenue shortfall, that translates immediately into a budget shortfall. And so many states spent a lot less on community college at exactly the time when everybody wanted to go back and get retrained. And so what happened was many of those students went to the for-profit sector because those schools were receiving federal funding and they actually had a lot more money supplemented by federal funds. And so um, enrollment in the for-profit sector really boomed right after the Great Recession. This was an unintended consequence of a well-intentioned policy, um, mm -hmm. but I, I don't want that to happen again. And so what I proposed in a column I wrote in September in um, the New York Times was that we should, rather than just boosting financial aid, we should boost funding directly to community colleges, give the money to the institutions to serve low-income first-generation students and to build in an explicit workforce component into that money and to think about community colleges as being an engine of retraining and of the job recovery. We've had a great couple of months of job growth, but we're still, you know, we need the same growth for about a year to get back to pre just to get back to pre-pandemic levels. And it's not like we had no problems then. So I think anybody who wants to declare victory on this recovery is speaking prematurely. And I think now would be the time to invest in workforce, work-related infrastructure for community colleges. People can go back, get retrained, get restarted in a career or started. And that's, you know, and I have more details that you can read if you like, mm -hmm. that's the basic idea. Yeah, and, and I fully endorse this too, Dave. Something that some people might know about me is that I got my start at a community college in the Bahamas. And so I know firsthand just the power of local community colleges to provide students with access to opportunities. And in many ways, one of the things that drew me to become a professor of education is, is recognizing that my experiences in that community college were phenomenal. The experiences that I had at the, the excellent elite universities that I've gone to have been phenomenal. And the experiences that I had teaching in a public institution, Clemson University, were phenomenal. And each of these sectors of the educational market has an important role to play. Um, it's, it's tempting for folks to only look at the Harvards of the world and to think as if we're the only ones that have the answers. There's a lot that we do really well, but we are a part of a broader ecosystem of, of educators. And we, have, we certainly have our role to play. And I think a part of that includes amplifying the voices of others, which you so eloquently did in your, in your New York Times piece. Raphael, I want, I want to bring you back in and talk about, so we're seeing this loss in learning and, and David has warned us that if we don't do something to remedy this, we could, we could effectively lose a lot of human capital. And that's the human capital that's gonna be showing up at the doorsteps of the CEOs at the companies that you study. What are some ways in which the, the public, what are some ways in which the private sector can be responding to this very uh, proactively um, on, on the firm side? And what would be your messages to the CEOs of companies, to the leaders of schools in terms of the ways in which organizations and institutions can, can, can prepare for what um, is potentially an, an upcoming crisis in education? Sure. 
So I, I think I, I would also add not only the people that are losing education, but there are also clearly people who have lost their jobs. So this is you know, a, a problem that is amplified um, at the moment. We know that there is a big chunk, you know, the economy is changing, not yet, I think, to the extent that we had forecasted back in the spring where there were, you know, talks of massive reallocation and, you know, all the, uh, everything would be automated. We would have massive increases in skilled in demand for skilled workers. I don't think we are seeing that yet, but I, I think it's clear that the economy is changing. So we are, you know, what the, the gap that we have to bridge is people who are currently outside of the labor market, people who are not even yet in the labor market. This is a massive challenge. And I think my main message would be for companies that this is not just a, a, a task that should fall on the government. They should be, I think, active participants in this effort. In part, it's in their own interest to do so because you know that firm specific, um, firm uh, worker specific match is so important and it's nurtured within the firm often. It's not that you take you know a package from the school and immediately you can you plug it in, in the organization. We know that there is a ton of capital, human capital that is created within the firm. And so I would say, you know, first of all, the willingness to invest even in uh, uh, individuals who might not have a Harvard degree, but see, right. you know, have all the capabilities that are needed. So we go back to the idea, we need to update the way in which we screen people. It's not clear. And Peter, you do work on this that I admire a lot. It's not, you cannot, how come we spend millions to evaluate the social skills of CEOs and we have batteries of psychologists going there and you know, asking all those questions. Eventually they all hire their buddies anyways. Uh, but we know we, we are willing to spend so little in assessing all these other credentials, all these other qualities and capabilities that people who might not even have a college degree still possess. So I think my first, uh, my first uh, suggestion would be think about uh, people as, uh, you know, you have a, a role in uh, uh, selecting people, you need to update the ways in which you think about capabilities. And I think you also have a responsibilities in, um, uh, you know, what you do when people walk inside your organization, uh, there are, there is a notion of high performance organizations are organizations that do very well in terms of performance. And, you know, so you know what, they also treat their workers and invest in their workers, they train their workers very well. So, it's definitely compatible with, you're not giving up on profits. And then I think a third piece is something that relates to change. If it's true, as I think it's eventually going to be true, that things will change. The way in which we serve customers will change. The way in which we deal with the hybrid work will change. There needs also to be a, willi a willingness to invest in people, in uh, you know, reallocating people within the same work. Uh, within the same job, you you know you the same company. You you cannot just lay people off, but you know you have to be very proactive. I think in thinking about upgrading uh, people who are within already within uh, within your firm. So I think that there is a ton to do, uh, and in a spirit of collaboration, not just delegating to to the government. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That that's that's excellent, Raphael, and I I love all of those points that you made about the importance of there being a rule for the private sector as well as a rule for the government too. And, you know, us being on this call representing the business school, the education sector, and also the public policy sector in many ways is very representative of this idea that we need all hands on deck. And I know, I know certainly that, you know, President Bacow has been I'm pushing the idea of one Harvard. And, and in some ways we can say, you know, like one whole ecosystem in terms of recognizing that this is a, a, a systemic problem that we need to tackle. I want to underscore two of the points that you've made, Rafaela. The first being that it's important for us to invest as firms in the skills of workers. And you, you made a very interesting observation, which is that firms spend a lot of money trying to invest in the skills and to assess the skills of CEOs. I, I think about, you have a student who's leaving law school, for example, they might be leaving some of the finest law schools in the country, but when they go to the firm, they have to learn how to write a brief and how to do certain basic procedural things that they need to do in order to be successful. And in many ways, the skills and credentials that they would get from, from college gives them the opportunity to be able to be trained. A lot of training already happens in firms. And you know, a big part of, of the work that, that I'm doing with Opportunity at Work is saying, look, firms are places where workers obtain skills 
therefore we need to make sure that we're not putting artificial barriers like college degrees um, as screens unnecessarily when in fact folks are going to be able to learn on the job too. So I, I, I did that point that you, that you said 100%. I, I know that there's a lot more that we can talk about. I want to turn now to the questions because the, the chat is buzzing with questions. I see over 105 questions, <laughs> which is some thank you all for your questions. Keep sending them in. What we're going to do is organize the questions thematically, and then we'll put them to our panel. The, the first question I want to direct to you, Dave, which is, um, is there, what are some of the ways in which US K through 12 education should shift in order to prepare students for the modern workforce? A yeah, great question. Um, one that I think, I know I thought about and I think a lot of us are thinking about. So um, first thing to say is that schools do many things, not just prepare people for work. So I, I don't, I, and I think that's good. I, I think it would be a mistake to think about schools as only places where people learn how to be workers. That said, it's certainly one part of the job and if you think about you know, when the modern school um, structure was um, kind of conceived, at least in the US, it was during a time when most people went to work in factories. And what was really required were basic literacy and numeracy skills so that you can execute relatively routine manufacturing and manual labor jobs. And that's not the world we live in today. And so, I think what you want to look at is to actually see what are the things that people end up spending a lot of time doing in the workplace that they don't spend a lot of time doing in school and to think about it as, you know, much more like practice, if you like. One thing, you know, if, if folks are familiar with the literature on measuring teacher effectiveness, one of the most striking findings I think that I think has relevance for this is that you can give people thousands of questions, ask them all kinds of stuff about themselves, their GPAs, where they went to college, all, you know, their philosophy, none of it predicts who's going to help kids learn better. Only one thing does, and that is actual performance in the classroom. And it makes total sense when you think about it. If you want to know how good someone's going to be at something, have them do that thing and have them practice it and have them get better. And so I would organize schools much more, not like workplaces in the, in, in the literal sense, but to put people, do much more project-based learning because works work is more project-based. Do much more um, team-oriented work because that's the way work is. Um, and to think about it as like practicing being an adult in the world of work. Um, and I think that requires, some of those things are already happening in schools, but a lot of them aren't. And a lot of it requires a fairly fundamental rethinking, particularly the individualized nature of assessment in schools, yeah. right? You know, students moan, my students moan all the time about group work. Why? Because, oh, uh, my, the rest of my group is a freeloader. I'm doing all the work. Well, guess what? That happens in real life too. And so you have to figure out a way to get something out of your group members. That's a real life skill. And so I think if we just kind of shifted a mindset, yeah. that would do a lot. Um, and I, then I think there's more things you can do, but I would start with the basics, make work more project-based, make it longer run, sorry, make school more project-based, make it longer run, make it more portfolio-based, harder to assess, frankly, probably more expensive to assess and more team-based. Mm -hmm. I like, I like those practical suggestions. So I, I've always been a fan of, of group-based work and something that I've noticed during the pandemic has been, so many of our students hail from all parts of the world. So we have students in South Africa, students from China, from Latin America, from the Caribbean. And it's been so exciting to see them work on projects, but to work across countries, to work collaboratively, to work remotely. And every time I get the opportunity to meet with them, sometimes at six o'clock in the morning in the office hours for folks who are coming from the East, I'm just reminded of how valuable it is that they're getting real world experience in terms of collaborating with people who are coming from different cultures who are in different time zones and using the technology for that. I'm going to direct the next question to Rafaela. So this is coming from a former school principal and he's, he's, he's used to talking about the four C's, creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical thinking as being necessary skills to be successful in any career. But many parents and educators still hold on to standardized testing and weekly puzzles as like the key for success. Is there a tension between soft skills and traditional metrics of success? And I wanna add a little twist to this question, which is that the business school has a very unique approach to education, which is the case-based method. And I know that as a faculty member of the business school, the, the tremendous amount of time that faculty members spend prepping for the cases and just the philosophy behind how putting yourself in the situation of a real world decision maker could actually help to develop a lot of these skills, right? So this question builds a little bit on, on Dave's response. Can you talk to us a bit about the philosophy of education that embraces the importance of, of, of 
of cultivating these, 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 these skills of creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical thinking as being complementary to these cognitive skills. Rafaela. Yeah, I mean, I think in part, you know, look, I'm a parent too. So I'm going to say <laughs> I completely understand the struggle. And I think it, in part it's because, you know, we go back again to the measurability issue. Everybody talks about leadership. Everybody talks about social skills. But I think that there is a gap. Um, I mean, the, the concerns that parents have in transitioning entirely to a, 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 an educational model that uh, is centered around social skills, I think it's, some, it's somehow justified because there are clear gaps in how well doing social, you know, social, uh, teaching social skills is not easy. And it's not just, you know, you cannot transition immediately a person that is a, that does frontal lecture to a person that leverages these social connections um, on, you know, on snapping your fingers. So I think that part of the, and then I'll go back to the HBS experience because, yeah. you know, I was talking about me when I was referring to that person. <laughs> Um, so in part, I think one way to facilitate that transition, I think, would be to develop uh, good practices that are really able to establish standards or, you know, how do you do this? How do you teach social skills well? Um, and, you know, I'd love to hear perhaps they already exist, but it's a matter of disseminating them and, you know, teaching uh, to the parents, perhaps what these are and how to recognize them. And then perhaps there is also a gap in how well we teach uh, to again to the parents the value of, uh, of social skills. I think the value of a good college degree is recognized by everybody that, you know, people do mortgages to send their kids to, uh, to colleges, but the value of um, exposing your kids to an environment where they can really listen to others mm -hmm. and give space to others and uh, learn from from this context um, I, I you know I'm familiar with it because I studied and I sent my kids on to schools that foster this type of skills uh, but again I think that there is still a knowledge gap um, in uh, perhaps in uh, in in uh, among the parents uh, population. Then, you know, going back to what it takes to teach these things, um, you're absolutely right. When you go to HBS, um, everybody's everything is based on the case method. In part, the case method is, uh, the belief is that by putting yourself in the shoes of the person making decisions, that makes the decision more real. But I would say that 90% of the case method and the value of the case method is that you learn to have a discussion with others where you accept other people's points of views and you learn how to make your points in a way that is respectful. And when I mean respectful, it is, you know, you have to be respected by 90 people in the room. So it's clear that, you know, in the room, you cannot just go bullying around others, although I'm sure it happens, but that's not what, what we try to teach. Mm -hmm. And when you teach with this method, it requires a tremendous amount of trust in the students. You have to learn, I, I experienced I experience this uh, firsthand, you know, we have lectures, frontal lectures, we have our slides, we read from our slides, we have our sense of superiority relative to the students and that's it. But when you really teach the case method, they are, you have to trust that they will get to the solution by talking to each other. You have to trust that they will get there. And uh, for people who have not been trained in placing that trust in the students, I think that that can be a hard, a hard transition. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, I, I totally see the value, but I think that perhaps we also may be doing more to train people to teach with this type of methods and to measure the quality of what they do. Yeah, I, I resonate. Yeah, please, Dave, go for it. Just quickly, like I think, because we've been, we've been, all of us have been throwing around the term social skills. I think it's worth just drilling down a little bit on mm -hmm. what that actually is and why it's important. I don't think about it as like the ability to hold a cocktail party conversation or the ability to sell somebody something. I, I think it's really more this idea of you know, in order to understand how you fit in in a group setting, you have to understand that not only your own capabilities but the capabilities that others have. And that, you know, if, if Peter, if you and I are going to write a paper together, yeah. the set of things we're going to divide up, what I'm going to do, what you're going to do is really quite different than if, let's say, Raphael and I were going to write a paper together because of our different relative strengths and weaknesses. Or if I was going to write a paper with one of my students or my former grad school advisor. And so it requires self-knowledge and also knowledge of others and then a very nuanced understanding and an ability to take the perspective of others and figure out how to fit in, when you should lead, when you should, you know, defer. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really 
it's something that a lot of us do intuitively and we don't fully grasp how complicated it is. The reason it's so important in modern work is because we can't find a technological solution for it. It's very hard to program a machine to have an unscripted two minute conversation with another human, with a human being that is in any way convincing or, or workable for any business purpose. And so we just have to rely on people's kind of natural ability and ability to cultivate that, you know, self-knowledge and knowledge of others and how to mix the two together. So I, I think it's, I just want to say, I don't think it's like, oh, social skills, it's cute. I think it's a really deep and important human skill. I feel like yeah. that's important to say explicitly. That, that's a great point, uh, David. And I, I believe too, as the education, the field of education becomes more international and also as the workforce becomes more international and global too, you're working with people who are coming with different sets of experiences, different sets of capabilities, uh, different cultures, and just to, to the point that you raise, being able to understand yourself, being able to understand them, being able to understand where you fit in, and also being able to bring those things together to create something new that perhaps even supersedes what any individual person brings to the table becomes in increasingly important. I, I joke with, with some of the, the newer students in my research group that when my research group went from having one PhD student to three, three PhD students, I thought I was going to die because each of the students were very different in terms of how they operated, what motivated them, how they accepted feedback. And they were also working on different projects. And so I had to have specific content knowledge to help to push each project forward. And I also had to know how to transmit that through the lens of that own student's specific individual like life experience, their culture, and so on and so forth, and then transition to the next student and do the same thing too. And just to be able to know when to dial in, when to dial out, and how to adjust across all of these, these different uh, domains too. And so, so perhaps given the way in which we're, we're increasingly more interconnected, we could leverage technology to develop some of these, some of these skills. I want to turn back again to the question. So we have a questioner coming in from Azerbaijan who talks about uh, the following in anticipation for the future, for, for, for what future skills are going to be important for both higher education, vocational education. So for example, digital skills, green skills, upskilling, upskilling for adults is going to be needed to reduce unemployment. Uh, this questioner asks, what are some things that we can learn um, from international models of skilling? Either Dave, you want to, you want to take a, a first step in it? Oh, you want me to, okay. Um, so I think uh, lifelong learning or upskilling during career is a very difficult challenge. And it's difficult primarily because the institutions we've built, certainly in the US, but I think in many other countries, aren't really designed for that. It's very hard to take a break from, you know, if you're an academic, you can take a sabbatical. You know, you can't take a sabbatical in most jobs. And even then, it's kind of, you know, th that like, privilege is disappearing from a lot of that. Like the idea that you can just pause whatever job you have and your employer is gonna be happy to let you go back and reskill, I think is, is just, it's, it's not that it's impossible, it's that it's, it's just, it requires a lot of moving parts moving at the same time that, that normally don't. And so I think there, that's kind of a long-term issue. I think you wanna think about like upskilling and retraining for people who are unemployed. That is if you find yourself out of work, there, there should be good opportunities. I think that's a slightly, I mean, it's, it's a harder problem for the individual, but it's, an, it's a more straightforward problem to solve institutionally than the problem of how to find people who are gainfully employed, but need to make some time from their work to get retrained. I think ultimately a lot of that has to happen through the employers. And I think you do see at a lot of large employers, Rafaela can speak to this perhaps, they do offer more and more of this kind of upskilling or, or training on the job. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry, can I just, yeah, uh, on this point, it is absolutely what I see in more advanced organizations, where I think there is this recognition that this is an investment that you make on your people. Perhaps it's a selfish investment, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's that bond that, that you nurture by providing uh, greater opportunities. And where this does not happen is fundamentally an issue of trust. Because, you know, it's the fear that by training the, the worker, you might be training for somebody else's benefit, somebody else's benefit. Um, one point that I wanted to go back to, Peter, is this value of technology. So I, I'm doing some work now. I'm Italian, as you can hear from my accent. So I'm really, really passionate about this idea of, you know, there is a, a horrible situation now in terms of unemployment. And I would love to somehow help. 
Um, and one of the ideas that we've been exploring is using technology as a way to help unemployed people get, you know, di diagnose their skills and get back into the labor market. And in part, it's also diagnosis of social skills. So Dave, Dave and I talked about this. I would say one caveat with technology, it's never just a technological solution. What I'm realizing after months of work is that it's always an, an organizational problem that needs to come, uh, you know, an, an organizational solution that combines and complements the technology. Just thinking that technology, just dropping technology is going to help solve the problems that we discussed today of assessment, assessing the skills or nurturing skills, it's an illusion. I think what we need to focus on is this combination of technology and organizational solutions that are going to uh, hopefully make a difference. Yeah, that, that's a that's an excellent point, Rafaela. And, and I just wanted to mention too for the audience that sometimes people refer to soft skills as also professional skills, because the, the term soft skills sometimes can make it seem as if these aren't, these are different from hard skills. But I think what David's work shows is that these skills are incredibly important. They're highly remunerated as well. Rafael, I know that you've done some work looking at management practices within educational institutions. I'd love for you to talk just very briefly about some of the some of the key findings from that work too. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's in the spirit of trying to understand what the benefits of management uh, may be also be outside the private sector. And as part of this, you know, larger study that people can check out on the wordmanagementsurvey.org website, um, we went out and investigated the adoption of quality of management practices across schools in nine countries. And what we find to somehow somehow surprise us, I mean, we find that there is a tremendous variation in the quality of management practices of, of school, even within the same countries, which I think speaks to the importance of principles and what principles can do even within the same institutional factors. And in the correlations, we don't have causal estimates. So I think we need to be very careful here. We find that better management practices correlate with student outcomes. So again, you, it's not, it's not that, that we transform schools into factories, but in my, in my view, better management is precisely this ability to bring the best out of everybody involved, including teachers. And so some of the practices that we surveyed, for example, were observing what teachers do, but also finding ways to solve problems and provide assistance and being there for the organization. So that, that is, you know, uh, I'm not, a, I'm not a, an education uh, specialized economists, but I do believe in the power of management. So I hope that, that you know, uh, this can be somehow helpful for the broader discussion of what needs to happen in, in schools. Yeah. And, and that's important to note that a lot of the lessons <clears throat> that we learn about management in general, we see them mattering in, in the educational context too. David, I want to bring you in for, for a final comment. Um, you sit as the, the director of a center for social policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, what are some what are some things that we should be thinking about in terms of social policy at the intersection of, of, of education, skill development, and responding to, to COVID? I know that that's a big question to ask with like just a minute-ish left, but let me turn it over to you on that. Yeah, so I, I'm going to, that's a good question, Peter. Let me, in the interest of time and also yeah. just trying to give a quick answer to a broad question, yeah. I'll, I'll be a little bit um, thematic here. Okay, so yes. I think there's different problems we, we different problems of different levels of urgency we need to solve at different levels of the education system. So very roughly, I would say that for younger children, the learning loss issue to me is, is, is primary. Mm -hmm. um, and that is not because ch that's the only problem children have had. I think they, have, but I think for younger kids, um, because so much of young, learning at younger ages is accumulates, that it's critical to address gaps now so that they don't accumulate over time. And so to me, that's, that's the problem. I think there are ways, it's not an easy problem to solve, but there are ways to solve it. I think for older, older children and then for college students, it's a different issue. I think for people who are graduating into this job market or for people even who are millennials or younger who graduated into the recession, like they've been hit with multiple waves of financial crises and other shocks and growing student debt, et cetera. I think it's really imperative from a generational justice perspective to do something to help mm -hmm. people get started on career. Starts are very important. And so you know, if you graduated into a recession, um, you tend to have suffer earnings losses that last a long time on average, right? And part of that is because it just takes longer to kind of climb the ladder and find a job that is a good fit for you. So that makes kind of workforce development investments all the more important to try to help people climb that ladder faster to help them find better fits, um, I think is really important. And I think that's, 
especially important actually because of much of the loss we've all experienced the kind of social and emotional level. It's not to minimize it, it's to say that joblessness and a sense of where is my path and what am I supposed to be doing tends to greatly exacerbate mental and mm -hmm. physical health issues. And so I think if we can get it just at a very macro level, like what are the policy levers we can actually pull from 30,000 feet from the federal or state level, making the job market run hot, getting people back to work, getting people into careers and on to, back onto track is the most important thing I think we can do for people's mental and physical health, which has suffered so much during COVID. And so I would support policies, broadly speaking, that get, get the economy moving as quickly as possible and get people into jobs and into school and on with their lives. Yeah. Yeah, I want to I want to thank both Raphael and David for a very stimulating uh, set of discussions that's based on their research findings and the work of their colleagues as well. Um, some key messages from Raphael: the importance of management and management practices, the importance of of professional skills, soft skills for leaders. Um, that is certainly something that's come through very clearly and thematically through what you've said, Rafaela, in terms of the work that David has mentioned to the importance of, of these new skills as well for middle management and also for workers and thinking about the ways in which we can have that teaching core that you mentioned, the tutoring core to help us to capture the gap in, in human capital that we're going to lose because of the pandemic. And I know that there's so much more that we can discuss. I want to point all of you to our website for more resources. Again, that's hgse.me forward slash ed now. Thank you so much for a really great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. You're a great host. And Rafaela, it was great to be on the panel with you guys. A lot of totally. fun. Loved seeing you. Yeah, it was it was awesome. Um, thank you guys so much. This was this the time went by so quickly. You know, it was just <laughs> take care, everyone out there. All right, take care, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in.